in, in some minutes, but uh, we will start the, this meeting now in this wonderful place of, uh, of so, the Soldana Solidarity Center, European Solidarity Center of Gdansk. And we will start with a little movie. I will give the floor to Basil Kersky, director of European Solidarity Center. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, dear colleagues from the European Federation of Journalists, dear Mayor of Gdańsk, um, Dear Ministre Désir, you are the second time here in a new role, today as representative of the OSCE, two years ago as French Minister together with Prime Minister Valls. Once more again, we need your support deepening our relations with France today. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say some, I hope fundamental, introducing words uh, about this place, this inst institution, for symbolical reasons, not only to promote our institution and about the philosophy of our house, so you will understand why the organizers has been um, chosen this place for your discussion, for your meeting, and I hope that we will start today a new tradition. Probably it's uh, the first meeting <laughs> of, uh, of um, new events of new discussions of European journalists here in Gdańsk. Ladies and gentlemen, Europe starts here. This motto of the European Heritage Label welcomes you at the main entrance of this building, of our center. The European Heritage Label, the European Heritage Label program, initiated by the European Commission, promotes sites that are milestones in the creation of today's Europe. Nearly 30 places from the heart of ancient Athens to the Gdańsk shipyard, to this place here, are symbolizing the sources of European democratic tradition. The ECS, representing the historic Gdańsk shipyard, has been awarded by the European Commission with the heritage label because, of our, in because our institution commemorates the history of Solidarność, a peaceful movement a self-limiting revolution that started in 1980 to democratize Poland and to change the political order of our continent. This uh, modern building was opened uh, in August 2014. As you see, its architecture is inspired by the shipyard industry. The, the architect is from Gdańsk. He worked as a student in the shipyard, so you see the interaction, the inspiration is original. The heart of the center, uh, on the other side of this building, from, from this perspective here, is a large permanent exhibition on the Solidarity Revolution, on the history of communism and democratic opposition in Poland. Our permanent exhibition, which was awarded two years ago by the Council of Europe with the Museum Prize, does not only focus on Polish history. It is also dedicated to all democratic movements in the former Soviet bloc, and it documents anti-communist revolutions in all Central and Eastern European countries. Our exhibition tries to connect our Polish history with the destiny of other nations. So I hope you will find the time to visit also our permanent exhibition. It is very important to emphasize that the European Solidarity Center, an institution financed by the Polish taxpayer, 
promotes not only Polish democratic traditions, but also the history of the anti-communist opposition in our neighbor nations. Our public initiati initiators, Paweł Adamowicz, the mayor of Gdańsk, the Polish Minister of Culture, the Marshal of our region here, the Pomeranian region, and also the Solidarność Trade Union, obliged us not only to focus on the history of Solidarność, but also to be responsible for the heritage of other democratic and civic movements in Central and Eastern Europe. Well, to express it in a symbolical way, we document not only Lech Wałęsa's or Anna Valentinowicz's struggle for freedom, but also the political legacy of Andrei Sakharov or Václav Havel. The European perspective of our institution is, to be honest, quite unique in our times. When we are focused on the promotion on our own national heritage, creating, I would say, monologues, and tend not to be really interested in any international dialogue. But the ACS, our institution, is ambitious also for another reason. The vision of uh, the founders of this center was not only to enclose the heritage of solidarity in a traditional museum. Their aspiration was to make the ECS a central European agora, a meeting place for citizens who feel responsible for the development of democracy in Europe. The center is today a place where history meets the future. Our institution cultivates memory and caters for the quality of modern democracy with educational actions, civic and intellectual activities. We pose difficult questions to ourselves. Are we the solidarity society today? Are we concentrated only on our national interests? Or are we European team players? How stable is our democracy? How tolerant is our society? Are we investing in peaceful relationships with our neighbors? In our activities, we are guided by the conviction that the new national egoisms inside the European Union, caused by the fear of globalization along with years of crisis in many European countries, especially in the south of our continent, are a big challenge for Europe. Not only Brexit is the expression of this short-sighted, selfish attitudes, but also the lack of European solidarity with migrants and with, with those European countries that have taken on most of the burden of help for the refugees. European solidarity, so crucial for the European Union's policy, I would say also so crucial for Polish history, Polish economic, political, um, social development in developments in the last decades. Unfortunately, this notion, this idea of solidarity, or also of European solidarity, loses its or lost its credibility. The migration challenges have shown how many European countries today have a problem in combining national interests with the European common good. The EU is not only struggling with the effects of the financial and economical crisis, but also with the understanding of European policy. The reluctance to combine national, regional, and European perspectives together, and also the inability to translate the princip principle of subsidiarity to the challenges of our time are heavy burdens for Europe today. The European Union can no longer limit itself to the economic community it has to become more a cultural project. To think about Europe as a cultural challenge, to develop our democratic civic culture, this is the main goal of this institution, of this place, of the European Solidarity Center, and I think this is the main context also of your debates focused on freedom of speech, on freedom of uh, journalism today in Europe. And last words, our Jewish, Christian, Christian Jewish tra traditions for us Central Europeans are an important source for which we can draw upon when building a common home in a multicultural Europe. Regardless of whether we are people of religion or not, I'm not coming from a religious family. My father is from Iraq, from 
a Muslim tradition, my mother is from Poland, from a Christian tradition, but regardless, if you are a believer or not, we should not run away from the Christian tradition because it is related to the attitude of hospitality, understood of as hospitality to another. The 21st century is not only a time of great migration, but also great attempt at empathy and dialogue with the other. Our European home will only be stable if we Europeans will understood the benefits of hospitality. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your interest, your attention, and I wish you well. Fruitful, inspiring discussion here in this very symbolic place in Gdańsk. Thank you very much. And I give the floor to Pavel Adamowicz. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. First of all, I would like to thank you all for your coming and joining us here today for the free media, European media conference in my city, Gdańsk. I am extremely proud that I can see here in the audience so many representatives of media for whom freedom independence, reliability, and are still a great importance in following their mission to the community. You are meeting here today to discuss the importance of free media and the threats posed by spreading propaganda, hate speech, and fake news. Well, you couldn't have chosen a better place for this meeting. When Mr. Jens Mork from the European Federation of Journalists first approached me with the idea of the conference of the free media in Gdańsk, I thought that he couldn't simply have a thought of the better context for such a conference. For the people of Gdańsk, Poland, and I believe also for the people of Europe, the European Solidarity Center is a symbol of fight for freedom, for independence, for credibility, for democratic values, for peace. This was a long fight, but ended with a spectacular success bringing democracy to Poland and waking up other nations, giving them faith and inspiration to fight. Today, some of the democratic values that we so heroically fought for are under attack and propaganda begins to dominate over the cre credibility and accuracy of fair journalism. Follow journalists. If I may call you that it's extremely important that you have noticed this dangerous direction in which contemporary journalism is heading and you openly voice your objection. If only by taking part in this conference, as long as there are people like you, I'm sure that the reliability, reliability and credibility of journalism will win and the democratic values will Trump. Taking this opportunity, I would like to encourage you to visit the permanent exhibition held here at the European Solidarity Center, special vouchers 
are available at the Gdańsk Information Desk in front of this auditorium. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a fruitful debate that will result in satisfying conclusions and numerous topics for further discussions. When I was 17, when I was 18, 19, I was a small journalist too. Uh, in this time, in Poland, we have uh, official censorship. And when I was a pupil, when I was a student in my, with my colleagues, we every month prepare underground uh, illegal uh, newspaper about the political, social si si uh, situation in, in Gdańsk, in Poland, especially in our school. <coughs> I remember this time, not only that I was young, but it was a fantastic time when a lot of my friends, we, we were a journalist, we are a painter, we are the distributor, you know, three, four functions together. <laughs> like some is that. Yeah. When I was a student at Gdańsk University, we published uh, underground newspaper, uh, now uh, we continue it. And we, by the newspapers, underground books, we created community of free words, free speeches. And uh, Gutenberg, Gutenberg uh, machine, uh, the copy writer uh, um, uh, Xero was our, we, uh, our instrument of our fighting. We believe, and I believe still, that uh, free speech, free words are the most important for the creating the community, the humanity um, community in Poland. As you know, now, the political situation in Poland is very difficult. It's not very nice. Every, every year, every, every, every day, every week, me and people like me, we are very ashamed that officially, official politics are not very much open for the immigrants, not very open for the rules of um, uh, um, um, state of law and many other important European values. But your coming, your participation here for us is very important and I hope that your ideas, the exchange of your ideas, it will be fruitful for us, for Polish journalism, for Polish society as well. Thank you very much. And now I'll give the floor to Patrick Pennings, the Council of Europe, for a welcome speech. Thank you, Mogens. I must say I've, I discovered I have something in common with the president of, of Gdansk. That is that I was young too at some point. Now, on a more serious note, first of all, this place means a lot to me for many reasons. The director already mentioned the fact that this place has received the Council of Europe Museum Prize for its contribution to European heritage, European solidarity, and defending its values. But also because in 1980, I was a, political, a young political science student and selling stickers to support solidarity here in Poland amongst fellow students. I was close to the trade union 
organization at the time. And this was a very important development. In 1989, I was able to join the Council of Europe, and I saw that from a Western European organization, thanks to the achievements of solidarity, thanks to the achievements of Poland, throughout the 1990s, we were able to integrate 18 countries from Central and Eastern Europe in 10 years' time. Because of the changes, the democratic changes that it brought about. You will say that's maybe leading us a bit astray from the topic of the conference, but nothing is more valid today than this reflection about what does free speech and freedom of expression and free journalism bring to the democratic development of our societies. Freedom of expression is protected by Article 10 of the European Convention of Human Rights. It's a basic precondition for any democratic system and for the protection of all other fundamental rights. Individuals of all backgrounds and beliefs have the right to speak up their minds even when their opinions are offensive and shocking to others, provided that they do not incite violence or hatred. Open debate enables our societies to uncover the truth and make decisions on the common good. Free speech, supported by a diverse and independent media which you represent, allows citizens to make informed choices and helps ensure that powerful in interests are held to account. Free speech, free media, is a cornerstone to democratic society. The trend of growing distrust in democratic institutions has not spared the media, both traditional and new. This is not all of the media's own making. Growing partisanship, populist attacks and fragmentation of public discourse into ideologically charged echo chambers all contribute to delegitimizing the press. At the same time, the competitive pressures produced by the digital revolution have seriously threatened the financial viability of traditional media. Forcing painful adaptations and making quality journalism less affordable. Online media, on the other hand, are increasingly accused of ethical corner cutting and failure to abide by professional standards. Free and independent media continue to be essential in the fight against abuse and corruption, sometimes at very high personal cost to the journalists and editors behind the stories. They are also a reminder that serious journalism is not possible without a protective legal and institutional environment, flawed def defamation laws, impunity for attacks and intimidation of media professionals, whistleblowers, or the denial of access to information held by public authorities, ultimately, they all tend to make life easier for those who betray the public trust. This would be the words that our Secretary General would be conveying to you. He asked me to convey a lot of success to this conference, and so does Dunja Mijatovic, who is the Commissioner-elect um, of human rights of the Council of Europe, who was in Strasbourg and unfortunately could not be with you today. The question remains is, are we going in the right direction? And I'm afraid you will be hearing a lot of the same stories this coming days. We face a growing distrust in democratic institutions which contribute to delegitimizing the press. Impunity endures. 18 murderers of journalists remain free. 130 journalists are detained primarily in Turkey, Azerbaijan, the Russian Federation and Ukraine. 50 cases of violations were brought on Article 10 to the European Court of Human Rights. 33 violations were found by the court in 2017. Independence of media is undermined by arbitrary shutdown and financial manipulation. 
independence of the media, internet is arbitrary, blocked and filtered. Fear and self-censorship seem to reign. In 2017, we saw a trend to restrict the media's ability to carry out what they are there for, their watchdog function. Now, this seems to be a very bleak picture, but we also have to see that the non-governmental organizations, the journalist associations, which you represent, have a fundamental role to play. All actors that are there to defend democratic citizenship through free media, they have to unite, they have to work together. The European Federation of Journalists on its own was posting almost 90% of the alerts on the platform for the protection of journalists, together with its partners, Index on Censorship and many others, the Association of European Journalists, I won't name them all, but this is a fundamental tool that we have to foster. Unfortunately, we also see that the reaction of governments are far from being uh, supportive of this, and we see that uh, the reaction, the official reaction, is going down. In today's development, this we need to fight, we need to stand up, and we need to make governments act as they decided, act as they recommended. Their recommendations are in a very recently adopted uh, recommendation on the protection of journalism and the protection of journalists. Basically, they say we have to protect, to promote, to prevent, and if need be, to prosecute the ones that betray the free media. Let's make sure that the civil society sector, that is journalist associations, are there to make governments stand in front of their responsibilities. Thank you. I wish you a very successful conference. And I now give the floor to Manuel Mateo Goyet from the European Commission. Good afternoon, everyone. Jean Dobre, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear President uh, Biedragard, dear Morgans, um, dear President Adamovic, Monsieur le Ministre, and dear Director Kersky. Um, thank you very much for welcoming me here to the beautiful city of Gdansk. It's not my first time in Poland, but my first time in, in city. In this city, a city which certainly doesn't need to be taught what uh, uh, freedom is. Um, so it's in all humbleness that I'll share with you a few words about um, what media freedom is today for the European Commission. I'm Manuel Matteo Goyer. I uh, uh, work in the private office of Commissioner Gabriel, where I deal um, an advisor um, on media freedom and pluralism, but as well on copyright, on audiovisual. Uh, um, uh, questions, but as well on fake news, about which I'll say a few words in a, in a moment. Um, President Juncker, um, the current commission, and since she took office in last July, uh, Commissioner Gabriel, have all embarked in a big challenge, which is to make uh, the digital single market a reality for 500 million citizens. Um, in doing so, um, we strive to actually accompany a digital transformation which is affecting the whole of the economy and all of its sectors. Think about automotive and uh, automotive uh, uh, autonomous driving. Think about uh, health and uh, uh, remote surgery. Uh, think about the banking sector and bitcoins and, uh, and fintechs. But as well, of course, the, uh, the media sector in its broad um, understanding. And this um, um, transformation um, that we've all witnessed since around the beginning of the century has pretty much changed everything. You know this very well. Our advertisement works, our media is produced, how it is consumed, how it is um, distributed. And this transformation, I think, came without the, um, the GPS to uh, find its, um, um, uh, its path through it. 
Um, there was not GPS, but the good old compass is still there and still shows the north. Um, and some things, such as the north, has, have, um, have not changed. Take for once um, the ethical codes of journalism. They might have adapted, they might, be, um, um, they might have slightly evolved, but they've not uh, changed, despite, as uh, someone referred before, have, some are trying to cut the corners, but the, the underlying codes are, are still today, are still the same. As well, um, another thing which has not changed is that only an independent media environment, free from political and commercial pressure, um, can act as a watchdog for politicians and for society. The plurality of voices and freedom to express them constitutes a fundamental pillar of our democracy as we know it today. But plural, pl pluralistic uh, media doesn't mean just a, a quantitative question. It's not a profusion of titles and outlets. It also requires a media which is free, which is diverse, which is independent, and sustainable, sustainable so that it can fulfill its duty of holding economic and political power to account. And this without, of course, the undue influence of dominant opinion makers. Today, and um, Patrick Penning said it very clearly, uh, um, more eloquently than me, um, free media freedom and pluralism is clearly at risk. And not only in the neighborhood, neighborhood countries that you know best, but as well here in the European Union. The murder just four months ago of Daphne Caruna Galizia is here to recall, of, uh, recall us of that risk. But beyond this horrendous crime, numerous reports are here to remind us that journalists are working in an hostile um, uh, environment. The work of the Council of Europe, of Reporters Sans Frontières, of the Leipzig Center, of the Florence Institute, and many other observers, they all point to cases where the independence of the media is not respected. We at the Commission are concerned by this negative trend and I would like to strand um, the Commission's commitment to respect freedom and pluralism of the media, as well as the right to information and freedom of expression as enshrined in the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Unfortunately, as you well know, um, the competences of the Commission are limited. Um, they relate to, uh, to this precise article of the Charter and applies only when Member States uh, uh, implement Union law. It's limited, but it's not um, uh, nothing. It helped us, for example, a few uh, uh, years ago when uh, Hungary uh, um, reworking, reviewing their audiovisual media um, services directive implementation. Um, um, well, it helped us in that case, for example, to, uh, to uh, uh, address a number of concerns on media freedom and, uh, and pluralism. But let me go back a moment to uh, the digital transformation I was referring to at the very beginning. What is very nice is that because we've decided at the Commission to accompany this, we are reviewing or putting forward new legislation. Um, and this has allowed us to, um, um, to put forward measures which are not directly um, um, targeting pre press media and, 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 and pluralism, but which I believe and we believe will actually very much help uh, to have a stronger and more independent media sector. Two examples. Um, the current revision of the audio uh, visual media services directive, um, for example, strengthens the independence of national audiovisual uh, regulators. It as well defines requirements of independence relating to budgetary and structural provisions. Such independence is crucial for ensuring the current and unbiased implementation of the directive and for making the digital single market a reality, but as well, it is central to ensuring freedom, uh, media freedom and pluralism. Second, um, a very famous um, um, initiative is the uh, um, uh, commission proposal to, um, um, on the, um, for a new directive on the copyright in the digital single market which includes the very famous Article 11 on uh, um, uh, new rights related to copyright for press publishers. We believe that this is the best way to strengthen um, the bargaining power of the press industry, 
um, in today's online environment. And uh, we hope that uh, very much that this will move uh, forward in the uh, Council and, uh, and the Parliament. The proposal recognizes and actually incentivizes the creative and economic contribution of uh, um, press publishers. Um, we believe it will ensure sustainability in the press publishing sector and ensure that journalists can keep us telling us their stories. Um, by doing so, the proposal recognizes the importance of media freedom uh, and pluralism and of the democratic debate in our society. But beyond legislation, the Commission does uh, further things as well. Um, we act as facilitators by um, uh, providing financial support. Um, the European Center for Press and Media Freedom is my first example. Uh, I don't need to recall uh, you, of course, uh, its important work uh, on, on freedom violation and the, the, the practical help it, uh, it gives to, uh, uh, to the journalists. Um, and we're very pleased to have uh, recently signed uh, a few days ago uh, the new contract for, uh, for the year to come, um, not only for the continuity, but as well because of the new funding scheme uh, for cross-border investigative uh, uh, journalism. Second, the, um, um, we're very proud of the Media um, Pluralism Monitor uh, run by the uh, Florence uh, European Institu University Institute. Um, for their work in monitoring the risks of media pluralism in member states. Um, but you're not the only one. There's uh, others, the uh, Index on Censorship or the International Press Institute. You all do a great work in mapping, reporting, exposing violations on media freedom and, and provide the legal support to, uh, to journalists. Finally, for this year in 2018, um, um, uh, prompted and asked and, uh, by the European Parliament, we will be implementing four pilot projects for an amount of 2.2 million euros. Um, these um, projects will fund uh, exchange programs, traineeships for media professionals, but as well accompany the work of media councils and, and the promotion of innovation in the European media sector. We plan on uh, uh, launching those calls in the first half of, uh, of the year, so stay tuned for all uh, uh, the interested uh, parties. Um, as I started uh, with, uh, with uh, fake news as well, let me say a, a few words about what I prefer to uh, refer to as uh, disinformation. Um, uh, you all know it's been around for uh, quite a few centuries, so there's nothing new there. Uh, on the production, if you want, of, uh, of fake news. What is certainly uh, different today, and this is the phenomenon we're very much study, it's its propagation through uh, 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 online platforms. Um, before I develop a little bit more, the, the good news there is that um, uh, such a phenomenon has helped us uh, uh, cherish even a little bit more qualitative journalism uh, as, uh, um, and, and as well realize that we cannot take it uh, uh, for granted. Uh, my commissioner, Commissioner Gabriel, has been and is being extremely active on this front. Uh, she launched an expert group um, uh, at the beginning of the year. Uh, it has already met twice. It's still due to meet another time and, and bring us a, a, a report um, by, uh, by March. Um, we are concluding next week, so you better hurry if you still haven't replied, uh, a public consultation on, uh, on to understand and gather feedback from all stakeholders on this, uh, on this phenomenon. Um, we, con we are conducting, in between last week and this week, a Eurobarometer in this uh, question. Uh, 30,000 uh, European citizens will be asked questions about this, and this uh, will all uh, feed our reflection. Um, so all those threads, as, uh, as you can infer, are still making it to our desk, so it's a little bit too early to tell you the, um, uh, what uh, will come out of, uh, of this. Um, um, but there's four guiding principles, four cardinal principles that the, the Commissioner has decided to follow uh, uh, when working on this. First is transparency because citizens need transparent information about the news sources and funding. Diversity, because diversity fuels, um, uh, diversity of information fuels critical judgment. 
credibility, because the credibility of the information must be obvious to us citizens. This implies more flagging, more fact-checking, more network analysis systems, and more things. And finally, inclusivity, because there can be no long-term sustainable solution without commitment from all the parties. You, of course, the journalists, but, but many others as well. Um, I can uh, finally only say um, uh, uh, only one more thing is that um, we'll adopt in the second quarter communication from the Commission on, uh, on, on this um, um, date, precise date to, uh, to be decided. And, and one thing that we've already decided is that it will not include uh, legislation because we think it's not the uh, appropriate. Uh, um, uh, tool and the toolbox is much bigger uh, um, than that. Thank you very much, Barzo Dzenkoya, um, for the opportunity to, uh, to speak here. I realized that my uh, uh, speech did not include anything about my youth or about this beautiful uh, 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 building, um, but it uh, very much reminds me of my young years where I was dreaming and I did not get that far of becoming a naval architect and where I studied as well at uh, uh, the Deusto um, uh, University of Bilbao in front of the Guggenheim and of course uh, uh, naval uh, construction sites and uh, uh, walls, uh, metal walls are very close to my youth and the very good memories I've got from, uh, from uh, that time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Distinguished hosts, colleagues, partners, guests, this conference is a part of a larger program focusing the increasing conflict between media and politics that we these years are facing. The partners behind this conference is the, the European Federation of Journalists, the Council of Europe, the European Center for Press and Media Freedom, the International Press Institute and Nordic Journalism Center. This conference should not be seen as just another conference. Tomorrow at the end, we will set up recommendations for the way forward and will follow up the debate book that we have prepared. This debate book should spread the message and reach out to citizens because this topic is not something between journalists and politicians, between media and governments. Free European media is a fundamental pillar, as already said, for European citizens to take part in the development of our democracies. Therefore, I'm also very pleased and grateful that the European Solidarity Center, the city of Gdansk and the Pomorsky region has, have offered us this symbolic venue for our event. As we all know, and some of us remember, the impact people here in Gdansk had on building new democracies in Poland and following many other countries in the former East Bloc during communist time. I was here in the early 90s cooperating with Polish journalists who were really proud of having created new media to underpin your new democracy in Poland. Decades later, I went back to Poland both when the public service TV started to outsource production of their programs, even parts of the newsrooms. Later, two years ago, when the biased policy went worse by a new media legislation giving the government hands-on to control the public service media, I paid another visit to Warsaw. Today, the situation in media in Poland is not just a warning of what's going to happen when populism take over from our democratic values. The day after the new interim media law was signed, the leaders in the public service media were replaced, and next day, hundreds of journalists, core journalists, were fired. Recently, the private TV channel TVN was tried fined 400,000 euro because of coverage of a demonstration against the government. These are just two examples 
and both with a chilling effect as it clearly lines out that it's better not criticizing the government. Such a policy is totally unacceptable and dangerous for a democratic country and must be brought to an end. Later today, we will have the chance to get more information about Poland during a special session between our two first panels. We are here today and tomorrow to have a broader view at the state of media in Europe in a political environment that seems to be more and more hostile to free media and journalists. Take a look across Europe. Just south of Poland, Czech Republic has developed another cocktail of a prime minister, owner of one of the big media houses. He's strongly supported, even he's been investigated by the police for frauds. He's strongly supported by the re-elected president with a reputation of threatening journalists and joking with President Putin that some of the journalists should be liquidated because we are too many. The third part of the dangerous cocktail is the lack of social dialogue which makes it difficult for journalists to make a living out of their work and therefore do a decent work. We should also continue the awareness of the situation in Hungary where the media legislation has led to more state control and state regulation in the total opposite direction of what we stand on, self-regulation. North of Poland, we've got the happiest country in the world. However, in my own country, the state of Denmark, we are facing dramatic cuts in public service media. There are proposals on up to 25%. Look at Switzerland, waiting for a referendum on abolishing the media reception fee. It will tear away the fundament for citizens to take part in the democracy. We see a trend that public service media is under heavy attack without significant positive impact on other media, on private media, as the total media budget is not a zero-sum game. I'm looking forward for the panel debating how we can ensure financing, ensure financing models having both strong public service media and strong private media without state interference. When states start to interfere in media, it can easily get worse. We have seen too many examples on that. When it leads to harassment, journalists being beaten up and threatened, governments close media and jail journalists, and when journalists are killed, and we cannot bring the masterminds to justice. Tomorrow, Matthew Garana Galicia will speak. October last year, his mother was brutally killed on Malta. The court is working now, but will the mastermind be, be brought to justice? It's a duty for any state to bring the perpetrators to justice and not to invite for more attacks on media and journalists. Turkey and Azerbaijan are representing two countries where media freedom de facto is in prison. And more than 150 journalists are behind bars for fabricated accusers or simply because they as independent investigative journalists have made a very good job. When we in other countries, as in Serbia, that I recently visited on a fact-finding mission, see a high number of journalists being harassed and threatened and from time to time violated. We know what next step can be. Therefore, I and Serbia used the opportunity to urge the state president and representatives from the government to turn around and give media and journalism its full support, full support, without something like, yes, but. Press freedom is a fundamental pillar of democracy, and we must remind ourselves and our political leaders that the alternative will bring, what the alternative will bring. We have seen it in the worst case three times during the last century. Remember that it starts each time with the control of words. Therefore, let me use the opportunity to send a firm message to all European leaders. Stop all attacks on journalists. 
stop all attacks on media and let free, independent and pluralistic media thrive. Therefore, we expect from our political leaders, both in word and acting, full support for press freedom, full stop. In connection with this conference, we have launched a debate book with chapters on different topics on the now from nine European countries. You can read them online and you can order it and get it in a printed version in, during this spring. We will continue this debate, I can assure you. It's not only today and tomorrow, we'll continue it. We stay on what we believe in and urge for free European media. Thank you. And we are now ready for the first panel. And I will give the floor to the keynote speaker of our first panel, our new OSCE representative on media with freedom, Harlem Desir. Welcome. <clears throat> Mr. President of the European Federation of Journalists, dear Mogens Biegaard, dear Director Basil Kersky, who welcomed me here again two years after my first visit, Mr. President of the City of Dansk, Pavel Adamovich, who also welcomed me here with Prime Minister Valls two years ago, dear Director Patrick Penangs, Dear Manuel Matteo Gayet, ladies and gentlemen, dear Secretary General of the European Federation of Journalists, Ricardo Guterres. It is a great pleasure for me to be back in Dansk, a free city since centuries, and to have the opportunity to speak with you on media freedom, pluralism, and democracy. 37 years ago, in August 1980, just here, the workers at the Dansk shipyard began a strike through which they imposed the recognition of Solidarnosc as an independent trade union. The shock waves of their courage swept through Europe and made the first cracks in the Berlin Wall. And yes, that was the beginning of modern Europe. On top of the list of the 21st demand of the Interfactory Strike Committee of the Dansk workers stood the right to form free and independent labor union, Next came the right to strike. There were other social and economic demands, of course, such as higher wages. But I want to read their third demand so high on the list that it comes immediately after the right to strike. It asks for compliance with the constitutional guarantee of freedom of speech, the press and publication, including freedom for independent publishers, and access to the mass media for representatives of all faiths. From, from the first day of their strike, the Dansk shipyard workers advanced demand for workers' rights and material improvements together with demand for freedom of speech and on freedom of the media. Here in Dansk, shipbuilders were builders of democracy. The transition will take decades and is, as everywhere, an ongoing process, never ended. Adam Mishnik once said that the worst thing about communism is what comes after it. It was a joke, of course, as the achievements of democracy in Poland after the fall of communism are impressive. But it was not only a joke, it was also a wake-up call which reminds us that nothing can be taken for granted. Mishnik claims that in some post-communist countries, the often brutally greedy new elite are slow to learn democratic habits, respect for the rule of law, the law of the land, pluralism, and or tolerance. This warning can be applied to a lot of countries and not just to the post-communist states. And we are witnessing in many places today a combination of populism illiberal democracy and corrupt oligarchy, which try to reverse democratic conquest, to bypass the rule of law, and to stifle free media. We are living a time of paradox for freedom of the media. 
On the one hand, the internet offers an unprecedented potential for freedom of expression, access to information, and pluralism. But at the same time, the social media have become, in a few years, the space of a new tide of hate speech, disinformation, fake news, and online threats, including against journalists. Populist and authoritarian movements have turned the open space of internet upside down against diversity and respect for freedom. What was particularly remarkable in the third point of revendication of the Interfactory Strike Committee of Dansk Worker was the principle of pluralism itself. This was not a movement or a revolution which claimed a definitive truth against the previous one, but freedom of speech and access to media for all. It was not about replacing a single red truth by a single truth of a different color with the same intolerance or authoritarian logic and designing the opponent as the enemy of the people. We know who comes next in the list of the enemy of the people. The journalists, because by nature they are critics, they are always accused by populists of being the enemy of the people. That's the logic of all populists, to oppose their democratic legitimacy based on the support of the majority to democratic rights of the other. In the name of the majority, they kill the democracy. We have to fight for the principle of pluralism in front of the rise of populism. That's why your meeting today is so important. The principle of pluralism means that you accept that you will not impose your truth. You can defend it, but it will be discussed as well as your action, especially if you hold some kind of power in the society. The principle of pluralism means that we believe that ultimately the, un the interests of the whole society will be best served by the discussion of different views, that the duty of each and every one is to ensure that all the others will always be in a position to express and publish their ideas, even if you disagree with them. It is the famous sentence attributed to Voltaire, I disapprove, disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. This principle means that we think that we are more able and intelligent together than alone, or following one person or one party's view. That's why protecting free, independent, critical, and pluralistic press is key for democracy. Not to speak about the indispensable role of the press to ensure government accountability, to fight against corruption, and to guarantee free electoral competition. And that's why all the attacks that we are witnessing against the press today are grave attacks against democracy itself. In order to silence dissenting voices, the methods used may vary from verbal attacks to harassment and violence. In some countries, we see how economic fraud are a widely used instrument to try to silence dissenting voices. In Russia, the independent newspaper Novaya Gazeta has endured countless fiscal audits in the recent years. Accusations of crime and even terrorism are another tool, notably in Turkey, against journalists of Chumoyed, for example, and so many others. We have also seen in Hungary and in Poland the economic pressure on independent newspapers by cutting public advertisement. And this is the kind of uh, policy which has uh, killed the independent newspaper in Hungary, Netshabatkard, and which is a, a threat for a newspaper like Viborka uh, Gazeta in Poland. Attempts to limit access for journalists to information are another tool to stop them from holding government to account. In Poland only, widespread protest could lift a ban on access of journalists to the national parliament in December 2016. In Hungary, a new law will limit access to a broad zone around the national borders. The law may well handicap the media in their role to report on migrant issue and refugee, an important issue of general interest. I will raise a second paradox of information in the digital age, which is that 
while billions of citizens have the means to express themselves individually online, this does not automatically mean that we have pluralism of sources of information. Our information feeds are controlled by algorithms designed by very few actors, and we are immersed in information bubbles. They echo our own views and opinion instead of challenging them. The third paradox is that we are also witnessing the risk of erosion of pluralism of the press and the media themselves. The digitalization of information accelerates the concentration of advertisement revenue and media ownership. The situation becomes critical and pluralism is at an unacceptable risk level in countries with a combination of high media concentration and strong political interference. Of course, there will be a lot of online media and independent journalists and bloggers which will publish a lot of information, but most of the citizen will only access to a very few uh, source of information depending on the political control of these internet intermediaries or of the economic concentration uh, which is uh, just uh, the decision by these internet actors to choose the kind of news which will be accessible for most of the people. In that context, I would like to insist on four key priorities for defending media freedom. The first one is the safety of journalists, which is still at risk in many countries, even in democratic ones. Journalists are at risk because they are independent, because they are investigating in corruption is issue, on corruption issue, because they refuse, in a way, this uniformization of uh, the information. The fight against impunity is here the key. If intimidation and threats against journalists remain unpunished, violence and even killing can be the next step. Before she was murdered last year, Daphne Caruana Galizia in Malta received countless threats. Three people have been arrested, in the investigation on the car bomb that killed her, but the mastermind are not brought to justice. Her son, Matthew, is here, will be here today. He will be able to, you will be able to hear from him firsthand how threats turn into horrific reality. The second priority is to ensure the protection of media freedom in the new context of the fight against terrorism and hate speech. Too often, Restrictions to media freedom and imprisonment of journalists are justified using security motives. Vague and baseless accusations of support for terrorism are used to arrest and prosecute journalists. There is more than 170 journalists jailed in the OSC region, mainly in Turkey and some Central Asian country. But the same logic to oppose security concern to freedom of expression apply also to restriction on internet. We fully understand, as all citizens and journalists understand, the need to combat terrorism and hate speech, but we must ensure that it is not at the de detriment of freedom of speech and freedom of the media as a whole. We are absolutely convinced that freedom of expression, freedom of discussion, freedom of the media are a factor of resilience of society confronted to security challenges and to terrorism, and that it is not through restriction to freedom of discussion that we will reinforce the resistance of society confronted to security issues. The third priority is to address the important issue of disinformation, fake news, and propaganda. Disinformation misleads citizens, spreads mistrust, and undermines democracy. But censorship is not the answer. More quality journalism is the answer. More investigative journalism, more debunking of fake news, and more media literacy. The fourth priority is, of course, the topic of this panel itself, this debate today, to promote media pluralism through the dissemination of best policy practices and in the increasing digital media landscape. In my mandate to defend media freedom in the 57 OSC participating states, I already had in just six months to intervene in more than 120 cases 
in more than 30 countries. Most of these interventions were related to safety of journalists, to freedom of journalists. And some of these interventions also concern this country, Poland. Poland is a country where freedom of expression has been a strong conquest of uh, the labor union and the democratic union. But my predecessor, Dunia Mijatovic, and I had to intervene several times recently as the Polish media landscape is under pressure. In 2015, the government changed the broadcasting law and now controls the appointments of higher management of the public broadcasters and of the National Broadcasting Council. As a consequence, many journalists have been fired and the independence of the public broadcaster is in question. My predecessor made a very strong statement on this issue, highlighting that the independence of public broadcaster and the independence of regulatory boards are essential safeguards for a free and pluralistic media landscape. Last autumn, I intervened on the case of journalist Thomas Piontek, who was accused because of his book about the previous defense minister. He was accused of uh, using force or threat against a public official and insulting a constitutional body. He was even threatened to be brought in front of a military court for this. I raised also the issue of TVN, which was recalled just now, and which was fined almost 4,100 euros for reporting on demonstration in front of Parliament. Two weeks ago, I had to raise the issue of a new legislation which criminalized the discussion on historical events linked to the Second World War. I raise my concerns that criminalization of how one describes historical event will be in violation of international obligations that Poland has adhered to on freedom of expression, and that it is of utmost importance to preserve freedom of research and publication for academics and historians, even on sensitive historical issues. It's only the call for violence or discrimination which can be the base for restriction. More than ever, we all need free and pluralistic media, the daily bread of democracy. They offer the platform where all voices can be heard on challenges in society, on different interests and demands, and on options for solutions. So that's why we need a strong coalition in the defense of media freedom and pluralism, and that's why this conference is a very important step in building this coalition. For this reason, I thank the European Federation of Journalists and its partner for putting pluralism so high on the agenda today, and I'm looking forward for your recommendations. Thank you very much. And the panel, please come up, uh, uh, and, and Patrick will lead the panel. Work? Works? Yes, okay. A panel on pluralism. Pluralism creates and sustains democracy. I think um, the representative of the freedom of the media have already, has already indicated quite a bit about that, so I will leave first and foremost the floor to the other panel members. Um, but we could reverse the issue, that is, if pluralism creates and sustains democracy, media concentration probably creates autocracy. So I will give the floor to the panel's uh, members, Elda Brogi, Elda, welcome, scientific coordinator of the Center for Media Pluralism and Media Freedom, and also associated to the European University Institute in Florence, uh, Baris Altintas, uh, I hope I pronounce it correctly, MLSA founder and journalist and blogger, Monika Valecic, program coordinator of the Croatian Journalist Association, and Marton Gergeli, 
which is the editor of HVG Weekly, former editor of Nepsa Padzag. Okay? So I will ask uh, maybe Elda, first of all, from the perspective of uh, your work that you've been doing also with the Council of Europe and the mapping exercise that you have done with regards to media freedom in Europe, can you give us a little bit more background to that? I'll, so we have about one hour, so I would suggest that we have short interventions of about five minutes so that we can also leave the floor to, to the public. Thank you. Okay. Uh Thank you for inviting me first. So I will skip the slides that I prepared for today uh, if we keep this kind of conversation. Well, um, as you probably know, we are running at the Center for Media Pluralism and Media Freedom uh, at the University, uh, the European University in Florence, a very big and broad project on uh, mapping, on monitoring media freedom and media pluralism in Europe. Uh, the scope of this project is quite big because we cover uh, EU 28 countries and some candidate countries uh, each year. So um, uh, the, the analysis we do is really broad, as I said, because uh, we take into account a very broad notion of uh, media pluralism and uh, uh, we cover uh, many areas of risk, starting from uh, the very fundamental uh, level of, uh, I mean, freedom of expression, what we call the basic protection, so we analyze what's going on in terms of levels of freedom of expression, right to information, uh, status of journalists, uh, uh, independence of the uh, bodies that uh, somehow has some competences in uh, uh, fostering and uh, uh, monitoring the respect of media plural of, of media freedom in a given country, uh, access to the internet. Uh, we cover also the market plurality area, considering what kind of risks in each country are raised by uh, owners, ownership concentration. Uh, editorial uh, uh, pressures or, uh, on, on journalists and uh, media viability and also um, ownership transparency. We cover another area of uh, uh, analysis that is the political independence of the media and uh, least but not last, last but not least, the um, the area of uh, what we call the um, inclusiveness, uh, the, the, the social, let's say, dimension of uh, media pluralism. And uh, uh, the, the situation that uh, we, um, we, we found, actually, we have to keep in mind that is, this is a monitor that uh, tries to understand what kind of risks for media pluralism are uh, in, a, in a given country, so it doesn't uh, uh, give, I mean, give some, some kind of uh, temperature of the situation in a country, uh, doesn't promote uh, any uh, specific solution, and each country has uh, its own uh, specificities. So in any case, it's an interesting tool to analyze what's going on in a, in a specific country. And well, uh, in general... If I, if I may just briefly interact so that we, we have an interaction as well. Mm -hmm. So what would be your major findings there? Yeah. What, what are we coming to? What is uh, the, the major situation that we're looking at? The major findings are that um, no country is free from uh, risks to media pluralism in Europe and beyond. That uh, there are, uh, even in, let's say, uh, in, in Europe, that uh, is uh, somehow uh, the, uh, the, the, the place where uh, human rights are probably nowadays um, the, the most uh, uh, I'm guaranteed, um, we face some problems, uh, first of all, regarding the respect of uh, uh, freedom of expression, considering also the, the problems uh, we, we have uh, in terms of uh, uh, understanding what is the scope of uh, and the, the meaning of uh, the rule of law uh, when we address online uh, freedom of expression. Uh, still, some uh, 
problems with uh, criminalization of defamation, of course, blasphemy, uh, uh, filtering and uh, monitoring the internet. Uh, we face uh, at, uh, at level of uh, basic protection, um, a situation that is uh, really sad, let's say, for a, a journalism, because in many countries, the status of journalists is not, uh, is not um, somehow respected in practice, so uh, poor wages, uh, poor co working conditions. We face, uh, in terms of uh, uh, market plurality, of course, um, everyone knows that the uh, media market is heavily concentrated in, uh, in Europe and each country, in, in the, the, the countries we have analyzed, almost all have a problem with media concentration. Uh, editorial autonomy is at risk more or less everywhere, both because of commercial pressures and uh, political pressures, of course. And uh, uh, we face uh, um, uh, a lot of uh, um, political capture of uh, the media. Um, few countries have uh, uh, laws, for instance, on conflict of interest that, that are really um, uh, I mean, effective in, uh, in uh, preventing that um, uh, politicians are to make, capturing To the make media. this all tangible, yeah. um, do you make a listing, a ranking of countries within the European Union that says uh, these countries are really most problematic? Uh, uh, we terms. don't do a ranking because, uh, as I said, each country is, uh, has its own um, specificities. So, for instance, uh, a problem, let's say, in Finland doesn't uh, count, let's say, as much as a problem in another country. Uh, I always uh, give it as an example because we are always uh, uh, discussing with our um, team in Finland because they are very concerned that they have blasphemy as a criminal offense. And uh, of course, I, I would say that what is blasphemy in Finland uh, uh, has not the, the same weight of, uh, I don't know, criminal defamation in another country. So we have uh, to take into account uh, the differences uh, of uh, the countries. But of course, we score, we score the, the risks. So um, we have uh, a sort of uh, ranking. We could do it, of course. And um, definitely, this, uh, this is and what allows us. You do us this exercise yearly. So yes. what do you see has a, a major trend? Where are we heading? Are we heading in the right direction or are we heading in the wrong direction? Well, as I said, uh, no country is free from risks on media pluralism. So, again, uh, we are in Europe and this is somehow worrisome. Uh, there are still many problems that need to be addressed, uh, like, uh, I mean, the, again, the scope of uh, the rule of law in, when addressing the online environment, uh, many other big and small issues, uh, like I don't know, for instance, one of the things that uh, struck, struck me the most is uh, 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 state advertising, for instance. There is a, a big problem in the eastern countries in Europe. Uh, we are facing uh, probably uh, some uh, problems uh, with, uh, with journalism, as I said, in a sense that uh, uh, the profession of journalists is really uh, in, is facing sort of crisis, a deep crisis. Uh, on the other hand, I think that uh, uh, we are here and we are discussing these topics. There is a media pluralism monitor that somehow can help uh, the, the, the experts and journalists to understand what's going on. So I think that uh, uh, this could be also a good policy instrument. Um, and uh, we are taking care of, uh, of this, uh, these issues. I don't see, for instance, in the rest of the world, a similar attention 
honestly, I think that uh, Europe uh, in this regard is uh, heading the, the right way. Of course, uh, when uh, we, mm, we uh, implemented, we, we, um, uh, we uh, selected the indicators of the NPM, uh, considering that we had to, uh, to implement it in Europe, for instance, we didn't uh, include uh, a, a variable within the indicator on status of journalists on uh, killings of journalists, because we thought we were free from this problem. And uh, we were really, really sad <laughs> uh, when uh, uh, we had that news from Malta, of course. And but now we you say that. in Europe, of course, there is a certain awareness, which yeah. we all agree. We ha even have a representative yeah. of the OSCE for the freedom of the media. Uh, our European Commissioner for Human Rights is also paying attention or paying attention to that. But is it not only lip service? that our governments are paying? And are we not into a situation where we know all the standards? For example, the Council of Europe, I rem reminded you that the Council of Europe Committee of Ministers mm -hmm. adopted a recommendation on the protection and promotion of the work of journalists. But at the same time, we see that the negative downward trend is there. We, the committee, the same committee of ministers will adopt in the coming weeks um, a recommendation on media ownership. But mm -hmm. we see on the one side that there is a tendency to say, yes, we know all the norms and we've made them very specific. We have all the indicators that you measure. Yeah. But are we there also to, uh, to be able to respond to them? Are we responding to that positively? Uh, well, uh, probably not too much, I would say. Um, I would call, uh, for instance, also the European institutions to do, to do more on, on that. Um, again, there are uh, mechanisms like uh, the rule of law mechanism that was uh, triggered uh, with, uh, with Poland. Of course, that can be useful. Uh, it's a matter of fact that, that uh, first of all, the world is uh, changing a lot and the information world is uh, changing a lot. It's really difficult sometimes to understand it and to tackle the problems it raises in an in effective, in, in effective way. So um, I think that uh, what we have to do is to keep trying to understand better what's going on. Again, this uh, issue of the fake news, uh, in, in my opinion, is really indicative on, on that because, honestly, we are trying to um, find solutions for something that is uh, difficult to define first. So we have uh, to, I mean, come down a moment, understand what's going on, and uh, analyze the, uh, the, the, the situation, uh, uh, understand whether uh, this is really a threat for elections, for democracy, and then take all the, the steps needed to uh, counteract this kind of phenomena. Um, I think that uh, we really have to do a lot still, and thinking also uh, about the future. Uh, let me give you another example, uh, elections and, I don't know, micro-targeting. So it's not only an issue of uh, uh, media freedom, but also, uh, I mean, uh, private, uh, privacy protection, how, I mean, new media are shaping the, the political uh, agenda and communication, uh, doing uh, a, um, I mean, a communication that is targeted uh, on, on people, on individuals. So we have uh, to study more, I would say, and uh, definitely take uh, some uh, uh, concrete action to um, understand and counteract uh, these uh, trends. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elda. I keep an open eye on the public, so if you feel that you want to raise an issue with one person or the other, please do so. Otherwise, I will ask um, Baris her reaction to all of that. There is microphones there on the ah. table. 
Just on the fake news, the Council of Europe just recently published a major publication on not calling it fake news. I wanted to see it in the title, but basically it's called information disorder. In order to make it more precise what we're talking about, and that's, I think, quite important. Um, also, when it comes to media and elections, it's been, you were part of the expert group, uh, Elda, that has been working on, on media and elections and, and the importance of how micro-targeting may change the face of, uh, of elections, basically. Barish, may I ask you uh, to intervene? Is this on? No. Yes. Can you guys hear me? Hi. Uh, first of all, uh, my name is Barish, and I'm with the Media and Law Studies Association which what I do is, I'll come to that, but um, I do, I spend a lot of time in courts <laughs> because uh, for the past one and a half years, uh, we've had a lot of journalists in courts and I'm not gonna bore you with, you know, what, you know, we all know the situation in Turkey. I just wanna make a brief introduction. So we do a lot of documenting and monitoring and we're reading indictments all the time. And uh, before the MLSA, I was with another organization which did the same thing. So we're also doing a lot of monitoring and um, and these court processes are very difficult for me because I'm listing, but at MLSA, some of the journalists in these courts are our clients because we have two lawyers and all of our other members are courts reporters. So, And the other half are our friends, uh, especially in some cases, I know more than half of the suspects because I worked at a newspaper uh, that was shut down by a decree for a long time. <laughs> and so, so there's a lot of, um, um, you know, monitoring. And like you said, all these trends, I think, are more or less uh, the same in most countries. I also did a lot of uh, monitoring for, um, until recently, Index on Censorship. So um, I think uh, what, like, what you say, there's a risk. Every country in Europe is at risk. Definitely, I think every country in the world is definitely at risk of what's going on. But um, um, about, um, I just want to give you some um, a, um, a context on um, on our background and maybe combine that with what fake news is, is or means. But um, how I see now, uh, you know, sitting at where I am and looking at uh, what happened to Turkey over the past maybe decade and speaking and thinking about pluralism, here's what I'm thinking. And that's not as a journalist or not as somebody who's like, you know, working on indictments and journalist <laughs> cases all the time, but also as a citizen, you know, who watched almost all of our rights being taken away from us day by day, is that um, I think at some point in the early 2000s uh, under the AKP government, Turkey had a, 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 an almost pluralist looking uh, media scene which is, um, you know, you would go to a, a bookstore or a kiosk and you could see all these um, media outlets, uh, media, um, you know, these newspapers, one Kurdish, secularist, Islamist, feminist, this and that, and it looked very um, diverse. And in a way, you know, okay, this is an interesting society. If you came from outside, everybody has a say in it. And, you know, all these, um, uh, all of these very different ideas are tolerated. And now I look back at it, actually what, um, that, there was, I agree, there was some sort of a pluralism maybe 10 years ago, but I think it was an illusion in the sense that, and now I understand it better today, I think it lacked, uh, it, it lacked solidarity. And I think that's uh, what, I mean, uh, if there's anybody from Turkey here, <laughs> this might be controversial what I'm saying. But again, thinking about, um, thinking back about, uh, for example, in the, in a referendum, not the so-called referendum last year, but the one, uh, maybe the last free election we had in 2010, we had a, all, uh, we had um, a lot of polarization, which is, I think, quite the opposite of the word pluralism, where you have two groups equally divided into, you know, the two groups divided into two basically opposing each other. And I think where our media and also for maybe of uh, uh, general society went wrong was everybody was very disrespectful of the opinion on the other because in the, again, in the Turkish case, there was this referendum and there was this government saying, we're gonna end military tutelage, which I agree with, of course, <laughs> but, uh, and then there was the other side saying something else. And then you had to, uh, it came to a point where uh, the dominant side, which was the democratic camp at the time, which was, which uh, at the time supported the government, 
almost ridiculing the other side and and not respecting them and that was the start of um, polarization and just you know fast forward through that process uh, many newspapers were seized literally by the government through a, a banking regulation agency which is I'm not going to go into detail but um, so at some point you had um, at this point you have about 80 percent of uh, television outlets owned and directly either owned or controlled or manipulated by the government and we know that they have a lot of editorial interference we know this openly from tapes and that have been leaked yeah. so um, speaking of fake news or propaganda I mean uh, so we're sorry I'm you know we're yeah. met with not only like online misinformation but we don't um, we have a very, very weak media fighting against this and we have huge problems verifying the news. Um. As Harlem Nazir also said in his uh, keynote speech, the way to democracy is not a linear process. The way to freedom is not a linear process. We see that it has many obstacles. And in a way, uh, how do you see this situation that you've been describing? Is that somehow pre-monitoring where we are heading in Europe? Or is that a peculiar situation that is only there because of the context of the country? Oh, well, everything must come to an end. <laughs> so I'm just, uh, I think it's a phase that it will, um, that it will pass. Also, I want to say um, a good things also have been coming out. For example, now what uh, we have left of this uh, you know, democratic opposition, we're seeing more solidarity, we're learning to maybe even if we don't agree with each other or sometimes hate each other's ideas just to uh, stick together which is very new and um, and to my surprise civil society you know NGOs like us uh, uh, journalism organizations have proven to be very resilient and we still have uh, people reporting and um, we have a great verification project to fight uh, fake news which uh, was initially seen maybe as an alternative and maybe anti-government um, project. It's called Tate.org, but now they're quoted even by the mainstream media. So uh, we have some good journalism is coming out. But of course, what is um, even in these adverse, um, you know, circumstances, they they give way to new things. But of course, there's um, what is very important, I think, in that respect. in new media is, um, of course, financing models, and we will have a panel on that after that. I think that remain it remains to be seen how um, sustainable they are going to be. Thank you. Thank you. Monica, could you please also say a little bit um, from the Croatian Journalist Association, how do you see uh, the developments in Croatia and how does that um, reflect the reality that we are facing in Europe today? In terms of media pluralism, well, um, I don't know where to start <laughs> because it's a complicated sociological issue, you know. Um, Croatian media scene um, changed a lot within the last 20 or 30 years structurally. Like um, we went through change of a political system, all the legisla legislation, the culture, um, um, and now like the, the free hand of the free market, you know. And um, um, I come from an association, so I wouldn't even say I'm qualified to make like big, you know, a policy pronouncements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Our association does take part in working groups for national strategies that have to do with media. We um, advocate, uh, we listen to the membership, and then try to change uh, um, features of a system that make their work difficult, you know. Uh, but we also work with journalists, and um, so far I heard of a lot of uh, initiatives that are being. Um, created, like for example, I salute the new commission um, projects for the 2018 and like uh, cross collaboration grants, uh, grants for journalists, etc, etc. So I would like to use this opportunity to uh, sort of tell you that uh, when I work with journalists, they're not really applicable to most of them. Like the, the vast majority of projects created, the efforts made, where, you know, in, in project speak, the end user is a journalist. Uh, the bureaucratic uh, obstacles are too much. Like when you have a, a project and um, you're supposed to get journalists write some sort of stories or content, like most of them are not eligible to apply, or if they do, 
uh, they cannot um, successfully carry like other managerial tasks that come with that sort of money. And it's a problem because uh, like in, in Croatia, for example, a lot of people who lost their jobs and are now working as freelancers, uh, um, the money that they can apply for to create uh, media content is already very limited. And if the one that is being programmed and put into action is not accessible to them, then there's something wrong, you know? And uh, like, maybe it's not okay to say like the best journalists, but there's this inside joke within the journalism community in Croatia that, you know, people that you would want to read, they don't write anymore because no newsroom wants them. You know, they're difficult. They ask the right questions that no management wants to deal with. You know, the, the collective uh, um, agreements most of them have either expired or, you know, the new ones are not really happening. Um, um, the level of solidarity is high in theory, but in practice it's hard to get some benefits from it for, for like, the end user, the journalist, you know. And um, I don't know, I mean, we feel it. We're a relatively small country, so compared to Turkey, I feel ungrateful saying, you know, yes, our journalists are being attacked and the political climate is not very good for professional media. Like, it's almost platitudes at this point, you know. We gather and we all have very similar things to say. Like, um, what I'm interested in is that when I go home and, you know, a couple of months pass and I have my career counseling meetings with specific journalists, I would be able to show them calls for applications and say, like, you know, this, this is for you, you can do it, there is no structural barrier, go write about the corruption in the health system, you know, um, because uh, those are the pluralism voices we need and the pluralism of topics present in, in the outputs of the media landscape, you know, in the in, in newsrooms, in, in papers, in, in TV shows, like, so. And they are disappearing. Yes, and, yes. and systemically so, and what also worries me that uh, we take it for granted that the system is always capable to reproduce, like to produce the next generation, you know. And I mean, I'm not even 30 years old and most of the people who are from my generation who went to the same journalism school, they don't really have anyone to, to teach them about the job anymore. You know, if you do get a job, you end up in a newsroom and your job for a couple of years is, you know, to say what kind of heels Kim Kardashian wore or, uh, you know, you do the stupid like content mail stuff and then like um, you have to be very lucky to have a mentor, you know, and when these people retire, you know, already like the middle generation is a bit more disillusioned and maybe like more flexible in, in how they perceive stuff and the level of compromise they're ready to do. And then when my generation comes, like there has to be someone, you know, when conditions become better, you know, to, to sort of, you know, teach the core of what is journalism's job and to make the working situation such that uh, an individual with integrity doesn't have to pay a very expensive price to do the job, you know. And but you also see the phenomena that Barish was describing, that there is a form of resilience that uh, is being built uh, under pressure. Is that also the case? Yes, and I think it's very good for a quality of literature of a given country or for like the level of sarcasm, you know, the, the bar jokes you have, like, but it's not sustainable, like, you know. So you have to suffer to be a good poet, is that what you're saying? They say so. But you know what I mean, like I think, I think, yes, it's happening. Journalists are a lot more aware of the tendencies and they were forced to start to think structurally, to look for the community, to, you know, have solidarity. In the past two years, we have had first two crowdfunding campaigns in Croatia ever, and both of them met their goal, you know. And while people organizing them were happy, it, it was like for small independent media, uh, organizations that operate as NGOs funded by former journalists who cannot really find jobs anymore. And uh, while they said, uh, oh, this is lovely, now our crowdfunding campaign met the goal, they're also worried because everyone knows this is not, it's like, uh, you know, if you break your leg, you're not going to put a little like something on it, you have to have a surgery, you know, and, and this is just like, uh, 
um, it's it's not a good fix, you know. And and if you have like one or two or five, then suddenly it's kind of like, well, you want to do journalism, have a crowdfunding campaign, you know. And uh, while the taxes are at the level that they are, and when we have a legal system that's structured in a way that it currently is, it's not, it's it's not, it shouldn't be, you know, like in in the little box next to that proposal, it should be non-applicable. Like we shouldn't even discuss it, you know. So the quick, the quick fixes are not sustainable. Martin, I see you nodding. Um, what is the situation in Hungary? How would you describe that? All right, I'm, <clears throat> I'm now on a vacation from the front uh, because um, in 50 uh, days we are electing a new parliament. Uh, right now the Hungarian media is uh, in war. Uh, and. Uh, it's in war with itself. And I think this is the, the thing I haven't heard yet. And uh, this is the division of our own industry through a very aggressive power. Um, what we see in Hungary is that, that we have uh, we, uh, elected twice a two-third majority government, uh, which used that power to rewrite the whole media landscape. Uh, and in this media landscape, they created their own eco chamber, let's say. Um, and right now, we're facing the, 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 the situation that there's no sense in fact checking in Hungary anymore because authorities are not uh, interested in facts. They are the ones who are profiting from fake news. So there's a fake news and it, th th there's, there's something fake and you want to fact check it and authorities, authorities are not playing along. But this would be the source to fact check things. Um, so we are in asymmetric war and Mr. Orban, our prime minister, is proud about it. Uh, last night he told uh, the MPs of his governing party um, that uh, because of the elections, um, there is an info war against Hungary coming from foreigners, but they have less chance because uh, the Hungarian government uh, uh, was able to force out foreign companies, foreign media companies from Hungary in the last eight years. He even mentioned that these were German companies. So Mr. Orban pushes this notion that because of the ownership, a, a news desk would write in favor of, I don't know what, I, I, I simply can't follow his take and logic. Uh, but but, but this, this shows that, 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 that in his mind, uh, the owner of a media outlet is uh, actually the one in charge of what you are reporting. And I thought that was my editor-in-chief. Uh, that was the editorial staff. Um, and yes, they've made a huge progress uh, in altering the Hungarian media landscape. And they made a huge progress in, in, in uh, um, bringing more and more media outlets to uh, echo the Hungarian government propaganda. And this started an infight within our industry that within the media, uh, within the media journalists are fighting each other. Um, it is, I think, if we are now talking about media, the most horrific thing to live through. Um, and I know that, that both sides are actually uh, more mean to each other than necessary. So um, this is, this is, this is the, the front I escaped for two years, two, two days now. And this is the front I'm uh, going back on Saturday. Forcing out uh, foreign actors uh, seems to be a tendency also in other countries because external views are not really much appreciated. Do we want, yeah, uh, see if 
floor there, yes. William, William. Yeah, yeah, we'll. Yeah. No, 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 it's, uh, you can use the microphone. As long as you give it back, William, afterwards. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, William Horsley, Association of European Journalists. A lot of what you say seems to be really about the journalists being deprived of the basics that they had 50 years ago, of a, a number of uh, media houses, whether they were public or privately owned, where it was expected that you would do public interest journalism. And the, the players, the actors in removing that space have been essentially governments or government surrogates, but through the agency of these oligarchs, <coughs> government, uh, close companies, and so on, which we saw in Hungary, as was mentioned. That's the reason that the most respected uh, newspaper uh, in Hungary had to, had to close and so on. My question really is about um, what you think that governments should be told their role is in ensuring this media pluralism. It seems to me there is a set of laws. There's obviously laws on... Uh, on media concentration, on conflicts of interest, on standards in public life. Now, these citizens tend not to take this terribly seriously. We saw in the UK with the Murdoch empire and the cover-ups that happened there, the, the, the trust in media just collapsed. And since then, there have been hundreds more cases of phone hacking and so on with other media groups. Now, this is corporate misuse of you know, media power uh, combined with corporate power, basically to, you know, for self-advantage, uh, political interference. So say something about what the framework might be um, it, it, from your respective national points of view to stop the rot. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Any other question or reaction from the floor? No? Would you like to try to answer this? I can't. Um, I can't because uh, uh, there's a state capture going on in Hungary. Um, the newly uh, uh, founded media authority uh, has only uh, government-backed members. Uh, they have decide decided on a couple of times on media merges. Uh, and uh, they always decided in the favor of the Hungarian government. Uh, there is no institution which would uh, uh, be able to uh, defend uh, the remaining uh, free media, and if in t 50 days from now uh, Hungary elects another uh, strong uh, Fidesz government, uh, our uh, uh, situation will get even worse. Um, so it, it is simply like that, uh, avoid the mistakes before they occur, because if they do, I don't see the possibility to turn back. Yeah, thank you. Um, we decided to organize cross-border uh, like activities, and many of them, because uh, like borders are artificial constructs, and you know there are good journalists anywhere. And uh, with experience exchange, using the mechanisms available, um, teaming up, like having strength in numbers. Like currently, we have a commission-funded project um, where six um, associations teamed up in a platform. And every once in a while when, you know, a certain country's president would say something that's unacceptable, that would sort of, uh, you know, promote this narrative that, like, you know, uh, media is there to do something other than journalism, you know, uh, or when um, journalists would be um, insulted or um, some sort of, you know, bad practice would occur, we would issue a regional statement and then it would get circulated in all the media. And, I mean, as... Uh, as uh, boring and inefficient as doing that is, you actually have tools to, to you know, send to international organizations. You have like specific content you can forward that's accessible to more people. We inform about the context of a situation. We uh, inform colleagues uh, when politicians go and do like international visits, uh, they can get asked about it. Uh, uh, no one wants to be embarrassed abroad, you know. 
well, the majority of people don't want to be embarrassed abroad in terms of high profile politicians. And uh, at home, uh, it's a different gameplay. So, you know, uh, internationally, system gives you levers you can press uh, to get like a response, you know. So, um, civil society uh, organizations, we develop strong um, collaboration with think tanks and uh, um, democracy watchdogs. Um, we apply for funding together, we administer activities, you know. And all of those things, they're not really like a, a job for journalists. It's a job for project managers, and uh, which also, you know, calls into a question the capacity building of organizations and how much administration you end up doing. But it, it's, it's not perfect, but it's the best we came up with. Like. Yeah. Um, I agree with uh, with you. I mean, when you have um, uh, strong leaders, like in our countries, of course, um, when you say when what these governments should be told, for um, so there's the question of who should be telling them. So it could be international organizations, like you said. I mean, as we speak, Mr. Yagland is in Turkey today. I'm not, <laughs> not saying this in any political way. But do you guys think they're going to release people after he leaves? I'm sure he was going to say something about press freedom. Maybe not. I don't know. It's really... Uh, <laughs> Um, I think um, we should do something else, but I'm not sure what. But I, uh, I think we're, uh, the, all the suppression, I think, will um, lead us to finding that way, that mechanism. But um, I have a feeling that we're, um, in Turkey, definitely, we're all on our own. We don't have a government to protect our rights. We don't have a judiciary to turn to. So we have to, I mean, I'm sure there's a way out, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure if that's, other um, organizations telling the government to behave. It's something else. Yes, I have uh, a different perspective because I'm not a journalist and uh, I have a more, uh, let's say, broader uh, point of view in the sense that uh, I'm taking care of uh, uh, research on Europe. So I would say that uh, uh, what can help could be, let's say, the peer pressure somehow. Uh, I think that uh, what uh, the uh, European Commission, the European Union did with the Poland, for instance, could be a good, uh, um, a good move. Uh, I think, again, from my perspective, that knowing what's going on in Europe, it's already a good starting point to understand and accept and do this peer pressure again. For instance, uh, uh, two, three years ago, we didn't know what was going on, for instance, in the Czech Republic. Uh, now now we, we know, I mean, we found out that there are specific and very uh, uh, pressing problems, uh, I mean, conflict of interest there. Uh, when, uh, I mean, a few years ago, uh, the, the only um, EU member state that uh, looked, uh, I mean, seems to have problems with uh, of this kind was uh, maybe Italy. So uh, we, uh, we have to develop our knowledge on what's going on. I think, once again, uh, that uh, um, some kind of monitoring, it's a good policy instrument. And uh, again, we have to um, do some peer pressure. Um, for instance, what we have done uh, in terms of uh, analyzing the, the laws on uh, um, foreign ownership, foreign media ownership, uh, it's uh, something that can be used, for instance, uh, because uh, we realized, according to our research, that uh, uh, few countries in Europe have this kind of laws that uh, uh, limit uh, um, foreign ownership. Uh, uh, in the media sector, and in any case, they don't limit uh, EU media ownership. So, um, again, I stress the need of a monitoring system. We share in Europe the, the same values. I think that uh, we need instruments to uh, enforce, uh, let's say, these, these values. Um, yes, I think in the question of William, but also uh, all the uh, reports that, that you, you have given in this panel, we see our combination of um, um, the weight of some oligarch on the, the media landscape in, in many countries. 
political pressure. And uh, of course, uh, one of the reasons for the oligarch to buy media or to try to control media is to reinforce their own interests in their relationship with the government or some other political authority, either to, to win, for example, some call for tender or just to protect their own interests, to avoid that the press will uh, do investigation. In some uh, country, we see that uh, three or four uh, of the richest people are controlling most of uh, private TV and, and, and newspapers. And if you add to this what you mentioned, which is uh, the economic fragility of the journalists, uh, sometimes a lack of solidarity among them because of polarization, um, not uh, existing press council or, or kind of uh, bodies which will protect all the journalists, whatever is the kind of media they are working for or their political orientation. So you have a very uh, high question of editorial autonomy, the, what, what you mentioned. And, and that's a big issue. So what, what could the government be asked to do? Well, first, some governments don't want to be asked to do anything <laughs> to change this. That's one of the problems. But I think we, we should pay attention to some issue. First, the public broadcaster system. Because here, if we get to have both public broadcaster uh, system, which is well-financed, and independent, which is not easy to have both together, but you have a strong editorial team with quite more stable economic situation. I think this should, be a, a, should remain very high on our agenda because it can uh, promote some kind of uh, standards of, of benchmark for the rest of the press. Uh, second, of course, also this issue of regulation, also the strength of the regulatory body for example, for the TV and the, the broadcasting system, uh, to have a, a very independent and strong regulatory body, which could also look at advertisement issue. Uh, there, sh there should be rules, I think, linked to the protection of pluralism, to say that uh, government or state-owned company are not allowed to use state advertisement as a tool to uh, uh, support some media and, and uh, uh, put the pressure on other media. Uh, this is something we should, as a parliamentarian, perhaps, uh, to, to, to support. Uh, and I think we should pay a lot of attention to the social condition of journalists themselves. Uh, uh, for example, when uh, states give advertisement to, to media, they should also ask this media to respect uh, collective agreement regarding the, the labor uh, rights of journalists. In some countries, uh, most of the journalists are not paid after before four months, for example. Uh, in South Eastern uh, European country, it's a, it's a very uh, common situation. So um, I think those, those issue of um, uh, protecting the, the solidarity, promoting the solidarity among the journalist community, also this solidarity is a way to defend a certain quality of information because journalists are referring to code of ethics it's also the best answer to fake news. Uh, but uh, it means also that uh, everybody has to, to accept that uh, uh, having quality of information, having, having checked news, means that you have a, a strong profession of journalist. You cannot have this quality of information with such a fragile situation of the journalist and with no respect for independence of editorial team. We must also... Uh, that's why the, the model in, uh, of the public broadcaster as an independent uh, media is important because we, we must push the idea that even in private sector, the owners must respect the independence of the journalists. I mean, if a private investor decides to invest in a, in a private hospital, uh, he will not say to the surgeon when he has to do uh, an intervention. I mean, he choose to invest in a medical uh, institution, it will respect the professional. If you choose to invest in a media, we should promote this idea that it's a specific business, it's a specific activity. You can think it will be profitable, you can think it's useful for the society, you can think it's prestigious, but you must respect the specificity of this kind of outlet. A media outlet is run by journalists, not economically, but in terms of content. And it's part of being an investor in the media system to respect the editorial independence. That's something in the mind of some people, it's uh, not only utopia, it's an heresy. <laughs> but I think we should 
defend this idea, which is at the heart of the possibility of pluralism and of independent journalism. Thank you. I also to respond a little bit, the, we will, as Council of Europe, uh, bring out a new recommendation by the Committee of Ministers on the transparency of media ownership. Uh, and that is going to be decided by that Committee of Ministers sometime in March. At the same time, if I may take a little bit of a step back from that, I do see that right now we are in a phase where governments, rather than trying to find a European or international solution to things, they tend to withdraw. They tend to withdraw and saying, we know better what is best for our people. And that is, we will decide for ourselves how we describe historic facts, if we refer to this country, for example, or uh, how and uh, how we treat uh, journalists. How can we make sure that um, they, they uh, for example, there can be some kind of a liberalization within the limits of their journalistic activity, which then have to be narrowly defined. And that is a tendency, I believe, that we see in all of our countries. That is, you supranational, whether that be the European Commission, European Union institutions, or whether that be the Council of Europe or the OSCE, is to say, we know best what is best for our country. So we do not need your advice on that. And I believe that is the, the worrying tendency because the reasons why these institutions were set up in the first place was to counter the, um, let's say, the, the nationalist or populist uh, tendencies that were governing in certain countries. And we're seeing that we're probably in certain situations going back to that. And what can be done? It's, it's, I believe, not necessarily by making more recommendations, but ensuring that there is a power of uh, like-minded associations, organizations, governments, which defend those basic values and principles. And that is what this is all about. Media is not only about media. Media is about the development of our societies. And, and this is what we are facing now. Whether that be in Russia or Azerbaijan or Turkey or France or the United Kingdom, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Any other reactions from the public or the panel here? I see... Hi, Boris. Um, representatives, uh, well, repre not country representatives, but people from Ukraine, from Russia, from uh, quite diversity of uh, background. So please feel free to intervene and interact with the panel and react to the issues that have been tabled here. Anyone? Maybe I can add something yes? to uh, what you said about, uh, you know, yes, associations and like-minded people, organizations um, coming together must be the way. Again, in terms of Turkey now, we're seeing that... Um, so now we have, we're at a phase where they're not uh, respecting court orders, which is very scary because if you know, I don't know if um, you know, um, but in January, the Constitutional Court, which is the highest court, of course, after the European Court in Turkey, um, decided to release um, two journalists. Basically, they found uh, violations in their imprisonment. And, and we were very happy, and it was filed by one of our lawyers. <laughs> so, but, uh, but that well, the decision came out on uh, January um, 11, and they still haven't been released. So what is very scary here is that the government not only... Um, so there's now a constitutional crisis. You have lower courts not obeying the, the high court's decision. But now I'm curious, what if... Because the most journalist cases are not most, actually, only 12 out of 154, uh, are before the European Court. So what are we going to do if Turkey decides not to abide by the European Court? Then, I mean, this, is, this could happen, and it's something... I mean, I don't even want to imagine this, but uh, 
but now I see this happening, and uh, so this is maybe a question to all of us. <laughs> you know, this is like, you know, where, how can we end this? And and the, yes, the answer is in yes, coming together and um, at least starting to just like stay together. And uh, but yes, it could be a potential crisis for all of us anyway. Yes, it of course, for example, also Azerbaijan where the Mamadov case, which was brought, brought before the court, condemnation by the court, and still there is no reaction to the court order, basically. So this is what we are being, being faced with, I believe. So, uh, did you want to add anything to that, Martin? No, I, I was just wondering, you know, uh, about one and a half years ago, I've been uh, deputy editor in chief of Nip uh, as they closed it, and um, there was an outcry, and uh, and we had a lot of invitations to tell our story, uh, to show how such a thing can be done within Europe. Uh, we've been to a lot of international organisations and uh, and uh, NGOs, and we told our story. We we we've served as a witness to what can happen within the European Union. And, um, and now I think that in the past one and a half years, everything got worse. So there was this very uh, obvious uh, case where power was misused to shut down the biggest political daily and nothing could have been done. And um, and if I wanted to be an optimist, I think that the readers and the Hungarian uh, citizens have to fight for that. So if they need democracy, there's still a way to, to, to make that happen. And, and, and this is the only thing that can somehow protect the Hungarian free media. That's almost like a final word for the round table. So please, I would invite the others also to maybe formulate um, similar thoughts. Yeah, I can um, follow up on something Boris actually said during the recent uh, fact-finding mission in Croatia. Uh, there was a press conference and it went on for quite a while and it was like interesting topics and reporting on meetings and everything but then he said like that the only people that really need free media are citizens. Like if you're a politician, oh well, like it can be like not so nice, you know, if you're a businessman and you actually let the media do its job, inevitably you will have a problem because you will have pressures, you know, and it's a, like it's, it's a complicated equation, but it's somehow we have to make them understand it, you know, it's like with education, with media literacy, and uh, it's a process, like. Thank you. Elna? Yes, I, I agree that uh, it's a process uh, and, um, uh, we have to tackle the issue of uh, media pluralism and media freedom uh, in each country from very different uh, perspectives and uh, take many different uh, actions, uh, starting again from media literacy, uh, code of ethics, both for journalists, I don't know, for online advertisers now. Um, I'm thinking really in, in broad terms, uh, having in mind uh, what uh, we uh, study again with uh, the Media Pluralism Monitor. I realize that there are um, uh, realities like uh, Turkey or other countries that are facing a, a real crackdown on media freedom and pluralism that is difficult to uh, I mean, deal with in the sense that it's difficult to find uh, uh, solutions, uh, immediate solutions. Um, I believe uh, again on the, the pressure of uh, uh, the other states uh, about um, institutions, uh, organizations like the Council of Europe, the European Union, OSC. And um, uh, well, I think that uh, maybe some kind of uh, sanction. Uh, could be useful sometimes uh, to uh, make uh, these uh, reluctant countries to uh, to behave. Uh, uh, economic sanction, I'm not a specialist on that, but uh, 
I have the feeling that maybe at some time, uh, at some point, we have uh, to close uh, the, uh, the the flow of money, the tap exactly, and uh, uh, try to stop and make them uh, uh, think twice. I mean, before uh, uh, limiting freedoms. So sanctions. Yeah. Yeah. There was a question there, and. Yeah. Good to tackle uh, German Journalist Union. I think, Patrick, you're trying hard to organize a real debate, but it's, it's hard because there's such a different situation in, in the parts, uh, different parts of Europe. We, we face a situation in Eastern Europe where, where uh, conservative or reactionary governments are taking power of the public sector in order of their interests, while in Western uh, Europe, in my country, for example, we have a still functioning uh, public service, which is independent by the state, but it, it's uh, under attack of uh, popu populist parties. For example, the uh, AFD in Germany, they want to do away with the public sector uh, by the uh, in order to, to maybe put it on a pay TV basis, if you just take the uh, television uh, sector, and everybody knows that this does not work, because uh, with pay, there are only two sectors, they told me, which work on pay base, this is sports and porno. Uh, in Switzerland, we're going to have a referendum on the 4th of uh, uh, March, next, uh, next uh, month, and uh, I think uh, the opponents of the, uh, of the public sector, they are in a quite good position. Maybe it's 50-50 right now, and it depends on how uh, the min different minorities in the Swiss population, which would lose all their, their um, language programs, uh, you know, Switzerland is three, four, four, four lingui, um, if they uh, put their, their, their influence uh, um, in this um, referendum, they might uh, win. But I think this is the different, uh, the, the, the different situation in Europe, because I sympathize with Harlem and his say, uh, uh, saying uh, we have to protect a public sector, but we should not protect a public sector which is dominated by the state like it is in East Germany. Would you like to react to that? Yes, yeah, yeah, okay. But is the independence of um, the public service broadcaster guaranteed in the Western European countries? That is still the question. Not only the financial independence, but also the political independence. Um, so that's a, a major, major issue as well, I think. Of course, we're only in the phase of only establishing, when I look, for example, to Ukraine, we're only establishing a public service media there with a lot of problems with regards to the financing that cannot be compared to the German situation. I'm, I'm quite, quite well aware of that. But we're seeing a tendency in, in uh, all through Europe, I believe. Yes, just two remarks. Uh, and it's interesting that you've been mentioning uh, the diversity of the situation in Europe and the fact that, uh, for example, in Germany, there is a, a good illustration of what could be a strong public service, which is also a, a strong local or regional public service. But we can think about the BBC, of course, of a model. And in other countries, public service doesn't mean the same. It's a state uh, media uh, for uh, official propaganda. But in all the issues we are discussing, even if there is very different situation, it's always very important to preserve the best existing practices when and where they exist, because it shows that it's possible. And it also shows something. Of course, it's absolutely possible to have a strong government with weak freedom of the media, with some strong supportive media, but a weak media landscape. But it's not possible to have a strong society a strong democracy, I would say even a strong country with weak freedom of the media. And so it's very important to, to protect the, the best achievement and, and, and to work on the fact that it demonstrates something. It, it, there is not a perfect model somewhere. There is not a one-size-fits-all system. 
even for public service governance, for example, how you finance it, and at the same time you preserve the editorial independence. There's many different systems. BBC is not the same than Sweden and Germany. But there is things which are not possible. If you want to have a strong, independent and credible public services, you cannot have no finance uh, which is based on a multi-annual uh, program and no uh, governance which ensure independence of the editorial team. The second thing is that if I look at it from the OSC point of view, where well, we don't have economic sanction system which is possible because the OSC is not providing uh, grants or subsidy to, to state, which is the case in other uh, international or regional uh, structure, but there is commitment. All the participating states of Europe and more widely, because OSC is 57 participating states, have committed themselves since many years and repeatedly to respect freedom of the media, freedom of expression, uh, freedom and independence of journalists. And so we, we must have a permanent international discussion on it and also a peer-to-peer -peer review of this. And all the governments are accountable in front of their partners and their own citizens of the respect of these commitments. And this is the base of the discussion, and they cannot just say, we know better. That's the argument of all the populists. You're absolutely right. We know better than the other what is good for our country, for our people. We represent the majority. Yes, but they have took international commitments, and so they accept the fact that it's an international issue, because from the OSCE perspective, it's also an issue of security, to have a free flow of information, to ensure that citizens can have access to all information, that they can express different views. It's a matter of general interest for the neighbors and for the other country. It's also a condition of the common security. And, and in, in the OSC, freedom of expression is a part of the, sec the, the, the broad security <laughs> concept of the region. So we, we have to ensure also that government a whole country will help us to maintain this issue very high on the international agenda. Of course, there's a lot of issues. There is Middle East, there is terrorism, but security also depends on the respect of these commitments regarding freedom of the media, free access to information, free expression of different views, and the condition of an existing strong and independent press and strong and independent journalist profession is key for this uh, commitment to be respected, and so for the development of the security uh, in, our, in our region. So I think that's also the, 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 the point on which we can rely to, to uh, ensure that this discussion will not disappear like some <coughs> government tried to have newspaper to disappear. Thank you so much, uh, Harlem. I think with these wise words, uh, we are <laughs> bound to close uh, this uh, first panel discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Elda, Barish, Monica, and Martin, and of course also Harlem for participating in this, and we will go to the next uh, panel after this. Thank you so much. Thank you. And the next panel is a sort of a speed session panel. Uh, we have half an hour, and we have put focus on Poland in particular. Uh, we are here in Poland. I don't think I reveal any, uh, any news by saying what was also said from, uh, from, from another country before, that the citizens in, uh, in Poland are divided. The journalists in Poland are divided. Uh, this is very clear. The European Federation of Journalists, our steering committee, we had this morning, uh, and I, I invite my, the, my panel, my, ses, my panel for this session to come up. Uh, Alexandra Wobinska, Thomas Milkowski, or Christoph Bubinski, please come up uh, here uh, while I'm I'm just trying to to introduce the, the the situation. Our steering committee just met the three affiliates that we've got in Poland. And it was very, very clear when we met, two, unfortunately only two of, them, two of them this morning, that there is 
a division between, uh, between journalists. Also, what I have experienced when I meet different journalists. So uh, I think it's, it's on time to have this. So please. Uh. So th thank you very much. It's Thomas Milkowski from, uh, from the, the, the the association of uh, one of the associations of journalists. Journalist of, uh, the Republic of Poland. The, the association of uh, journalists uh, of the Republic of Poland. And we have got uh, as and Alexandra Rubinska uh, from the association of journalists in Poland, and uh, uh, the journalist society from the journalist society. We've got Chris Bobinski. Uh, I would like to, to, to ask you, Thomas Milkowski, because you were, you were the first, you, you were one of those who, who, who uh, responded on, uh, on my, my questions to you when, when, uh, when we have started to, to have this panel. Uh, and you mentioned in, in your answers the consequences of the amendment in Act of the Institute of National Remembrance. It has also been mentioned uh, earlier this, morning, uh, this afternoon. How does this, in your perspective, influence on press freedom? Yes. Uh, I must repeat uh, some motives uh, uh, which uh, on the first, uh, our first uh, key speaker today stressed, uh, because I want uh, uh, very shortly to present uh, our um, our association point of view for the situation in, 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 in Polish media, uh, in the current situation, not uh, from the political point of view, but from the professional. Uh, and I, I think it, it is very clear. It would be uh, seven points. <laughs> seven points only. Please make them brief. Very, we have very short. Only, we very have short. First short. Uh, uh, first point, it, it is uh, conclusion uh, after this change uh, in the public in the public media and uh, new system media system and uh, situation in which uh, public uh, media so called uh, national media today uh, are um, boss uh, in the uh, jurisdiction of special national council media and broadcasting uh, council of media. And this situation is objectively uh, give uh, specific, uh, specific problems. Uh, the separation has created a situation that enable a fairly fast procedure to change managerial staff almost overnight. And it is, it is of course, uh, uh, very uh, freezing effect. What did you do oh. as, a, as, as, a, as an association when that happened? Uh, How did you help? No, you? We, 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 of course, give our statement. We, we, we can to speak what we, uh, uh, what we think about this new law. But this law is. Uh, yeah, uh, but what did you do to help you, the, the journalists? Yes. The June, uh, we have we have our uh, only uh, very small possibilities because we have only uh, our uh, our page uh, website uh, on website. Okay. We can uh, uh, publish the uh, examples of of the uh, of the sharp uh, uh, situation when the uh, influence of politician is too strong, and then we we talk about it. Uh, about it. Uh, we can uh, present our position uh, in this case. I, I must say that it was the uh, first uh, situation uh, in uh, last uh, mass when the uh, point of view our association was uh, uh, very uh, important in the change of decision uh, to uh, uh, to the uh, TV and television and uh, reject this uh, very strong financial uh, penalty for uh, TV and uh, when we, uh, we together uh, with Chris 
Bobinski and other people uh, will, uh, were present on the discussion with the president of the Council of Broadcasting. And uh, after this uh, discussion, decision, uh, and after, of course, uh, discussion between uh, um, president of uh, Broadcast, uh, Council of Broadcasting uh, and uh, TVN, the decision was rejected. It, it is a practical uh, uh, moment when our voice was important. Could you, uh, you, you had seven points, I think it, it, we don't have time to go all, through all seven points, but could, could you point out uh, the most important of, 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 of these points uh, you have pointed out? I, 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 I think that the, the, the important is the new situation after the uh, change of uh, of the act of the Institute of National Remembrance. That was asked yes, yes, because because it is uh, it is a real uh, problem for the journalists. And we are not uh, we are not researchers. We are not artists uh, that have a, a special umbrella uh, to discuss about Holocaust. But what uh, uh, with us? with journalists, I am very disturbed. Would that mean that you, would, would that mean uh, less uh, f free speech? Yes, 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 yes. It, it, it is, it is uh, um, absolutely, uh, you are absolutely right. Would, would that create censorship? Yes, 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 we, we, we must observe this situation and uh, the censorship isn't, uh, as an institution, of course, in Poland. It's rejected, you know, but the, the uh, comeback of censorship uh, from uh, half a real, it's, it is a real danger uh, in the perspective of this law. Alexandra Obrobenska, I, I saw your face, you are not, uh, you didn't really, don't really, really agree on this. Uh, Obviously, yes, I do not agree. Um, no, um, I think there are many, many assumptions being made here about the consequences of this law on the Institute of National Remembrance. First of all, um, like my colleague just said, there is no censorship. As far as I know, nobody wants to introduce any censorship. And um, we have a discussion ongoing in the media debate on this law. And everybody is writing whatever they want about it. There's no censorship. Nobody is being limited in their expression and freedom of speech. Because there is such a thing as freedom of speech in Poland. Um, and uh, by saying there's a danger censorship might come back, we are creating an atmosphere of fear which is based on nothing. Because for now, there's absolutely no proof, not even a hint of why there should be any censorship. Um, there's none. We have public media, which I agree are biased, but they've also been biased under the civic platform. Um, I can give you my own example. I've been a journalist for the last 20 years. Uh, how many times was I invited to the Polish public television during um, the rule of the civic platform? The answer is zero times, because my opinions were not welcome. Now I'm being invited because the government has changed and somebody else has taken over the public media. So we have, a, I would say, an illness in Poland since 1989 that every government that ever comes to be, every political party, treats uh, the public media as its personal uh, instrument. Um, and this hasn't changed for the last 27 years. So um, this is something that if we talk about public media in Poland, we should talk about this problem a little bit broader because it's not only a problem of the law and justice. So, um, the problem was under the civic platform, public media were extremely biased, and today they are also biased. So, um, this is the general problem. Now, talking about this law of national remembrance, there's a general uh, guarantee of freedom of speech in Poland, so um, no journalist has to fear that if he writes about this law, if he writes about Jedwabne, about other uh, instances of pogroms um, of, against Jews in Poland, that they will be punished. Um, for now, we have absolutely no reason to think there will be any censorship. Um, and I find it really sad that we create this kind of atmosphere of everything is still okay, but soon, soon, there will be something terrible happening. And I'm he hearing this for the last two years, 
since the law and justice came into power, and still I don't see any censorship. So maybe we should just stop uh, creating this kind of atmosphere, because for now, there's no reason to. Chris Popinski, is there no censorship? Is there no, nothing to be afraid of here? Ah, oh, microphone. Sorry. Um, y y yes and no. Um, I think that you're touching on so many issues at the same time as their censorship. Um, the public media, the public service media are all now dominated by the government, by government supporters. It's basically, these are propaganda channels for the government. Now, if people work there, they have to be careful as, as to what they say, they have to be careful as to who they invite, they have to be careful what goes out on, on, on their watch. And if they, if they uh, do something that the politicians don't like, then of course they might lose their job or might be dismissed. I'm not talking about the over 200 people who were dismissed or had to, were forced to leave or resigned after the new government came in and when the, the uh, new government took over the public media. But I'm talking about people being sacked at the moment, people coming under pressure, people coming uh, still under pressure when the thought that they had total control, but actually there is still more and more pressure on people to, to toe the government line. Um, uh, another digression is, is the rule of law. Um, it's, it's my view that, uh, we, 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 of course, we, we're talking about media freedom because we're talking at a media freedom conference, but if we don't have the rule of law, if we don't have ind independent courts, uh, then it's very difficult to defend media freedom. We heard in the previous panel about Turkey where uh, court decisions are not being um, adhered to by the, by the government. Uh, here we have a danger that the uh, independence of the judiciary is being destroyed as we speak actually by the government. Luckily, the judges in Poland are resisting this, but um, we, we, are, we are in danger and this when I come to, is, will something bad happen? happen? Will something bad happen in Poland? It, will happen and is happening if we lose the independence of the media because the freedom of uh, the independence of the judiciary because the freedom of the media depends on the independence of the judiciary if we can't rely on courts to to um, give us good verdicts on defamation uh, cases on cases where there is uh, there there are differences of interpretation about um, the, the law then we are we are finished um, and then I come to this law about, uh, about the Holocaust, about uh, how, uh, how you can write about what, what, you, what you can say about uh, what happened in Poland during the war. Um, there is a danger. There is a danger if there are judges who will, who will um, follow the line of the most extreme radicals in Poland who, 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 are, who refuse to agree that bad things happened to Jews during the war at the hands of Poles. There, there, could be, there could be censorship. It is dangerous. And also remember, actually, that this isn't only a law about what happened to the Jews and um, what happened between the Jews and the Poles and the Germans, but also there's a whole chapter about Ukrainians where, where also there is, an, there is an attempt to direct people's attention to, um, to a, a, a certain line of thinking. So it is quite dangerous. Um, we do live in constant fear of the next thing, that, the next bad thing that's, that can happen, and bad things can, might well happen. It's, it seems that you, uh, uh, not, not only seems, it, it is clear that you are divided in, 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 your, in your perspective of what, what happens in, 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 in Poland. And uh, also very politicized, uh, often talk about that, that, uh, that uh, your associations are, are, are politicized, and, and, uh, and, and close to the government, uh, Alexandra Robinska, could, could, could you, um, uh, and, and, and an article recently uh, told that you were, uh, you, you were going to, to, to Germany uh, to defend the current media policy in, in Poland and that you were uh, asked to do so. Uh, is, is that a role for an independent uh, journalist association um, to do so? I was not asked to do so. I was asked to do so by the German media who asked me, who invited me, and I went, and I think the main reason why they invited me is because I speak fluent German. It's as simple as that. If they could have invited somebody who corresponds more to their own line and their to their own opinion on Poland, they would have probably done so. 
The problem is, I, I lived in Germany for 20 years. I speak fluent German. So this is the main reason I was invited. And as far as my, I work for a private media outlet. Nobody asked me, neither my bosses nor anybody else. I have no contacts with the ruling um, political party of the peace. Absolutely none. Um, I'm an independent journalist as far as I know. I don't meet with politicians. I don't care um, about it either. So I went because I was invited by German media. And that's all. And it, that's... Um, I think it is also, if I get invitation like these, um, and I have the feeling that I have to not defend, but rectify certain things that are being said, and that are simply not true. Um, and each and every time when I arrived in Germany, I was asked if I don't feel pressure, if I don't have to censor myself. Um, this is the kind of image that is being created about Poland, and that's very sad, because it has nothing to do with reality. And each and every time I have to explain that this is not the case. And I feel that I have to do this, not for because I love the ruling party, um, but because um, this is creating a negative image of my country. Every time I am open a German newspaper, even a British newspaper, I read that I am living in an autocracy, in a theocratic, uh, anti-democratic autocracy. Um, I live in this country and this is not the case. And I'm tired of reading these things. And I have the impression that many journalists don't even make the effort anymore to find out what is really happening in Poland. They just copy each other. One writes something and the next just writes it down and copies it. And so after a while, you had 500 articles like this. And people come to Poland, they're very surprised that the reality looks a lot different from what they read in the media. So I understand that you, we should be alert and we should look out for any kinds of attempts to limit uh, freedom of expression, um, but I just don't see that. And for me, the public media hasn't suddenly become biased overnight because the law and justice came into power. It was an extremely biased television before that. And I'm sorry, but every time somebody came, uh, won the elections, when the civic platform won the elections, they exchanged anyone they could in the public media. And many of my conservative colleagues were let go and had to leave. They were thrown out. So I don't know why my colleague here um, protests now and didn't protest then. Um, these are some things that are every time surprise me. We, we, I think we, have all, we have actually protested from the European Federation of Journalists, both, uh, both in 2013 and, and, and now. Um, uh, uh, Thomas Minkowski, uh, is the situation uh, uh, free and for, 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 for media? In, do you see it as free media in, 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 in Poland and, and, and not as bad as... as uh, uh, Alexander Rubinska is saying it's, it's not a big problem. Uh, it depends from the point of view, of course. Uh, as you uh, try uh, to estimate uh, uh, Polish media, especially I, I mean about uh, public media, uh, media, uh, so called national media, I, uh, I must say. Uh, that I, I hear from the, uh, uh, all of uh, informational blocks, uh, uh, from the informational, uh, from the news, uh, only one uh, dominate point of view, only governmental or governmental majority uh, uh, point of view. But uh, uh, this, uh, uh, it, it is, it, it, uh, I, I, I want to be. Uh, uh, good. Uh, uh, mean, um, I I don't want to say that uh, the pluralism is absolutely abolished in uh, Polish uh, television, uh, uh, public television, but it is limited. It, it, the scope of this uh, uh, others' point of view is very is uh, is limited. It's very shortly presented. Uh, uh, and there is no balance between uh, other uh, side of the political scene. And it is, it is a problem of the, our problem today. Uh, and it, it is a fundamental problem which uh, grows step by step, in my opinion. Uh, Chris Popinski, um, uh, has it a chilling effect or hasn't has it a chilling effect? Uh, the, the 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 new le the legislation coming up is it? 
new legislation. Yeah, ha the, 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 on, on, on the, on the <coughs> remembrance, uh, on the uh, media law, uh, what, what we see, on uh, the, the, no, the, the test on uh, that, that when they try to find uh, the, the TV channel and, and, and yeah. didn't do it in the end. The, 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 the 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 the, uh, the the Holocaust legislation is a separate issue. I, I don't think we should actually put it together with the rest because it's a very specific case. It's an act of idiocy by the Polish government, and they shouldn't have done it. They've managed to, to uh, antagonize not only the, the Israelis, they've managed to antagonize the Americans, they've antagonized, uh, but seriously antagonized the Americans, and they shouldn't have done it because it was a very, very stupid move. Um, and, but it's not in the mainstream what's happening. What is in the mainstream what is happening is that, first of all, they took control of the public service media, which has, has been turned into basically a propaganda channel. There may be shades of propaganda, but it's basically a propaganda channel, which puts out the, the government mes message at the moment, which is completely counter to every kind of uh, Council of Europe um, standard setting uh, agreement that Poland has signed up to this just shouldn't be happening. They're using public money, they're using everyone's money to put the line of the government and it's just not fair. Their, prob their basic problem at the moment is the, is the privately owned media, the, uh, the, uh, the electronic, the television and the, uh, the privately owned radio uh, and also the, the independent newspapers which aren't regulated and the, 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 it's fairly clear from what the government people are saying is that they would like to also bring those more and more under control. They're not doing it at the moment, doing it at the moment because these are foreign owned. They're owned by uh, uh, German companies, they're owned by American companies, and simply put the cost, the political costs of doing this, they see, they see would be too great at the moment. But this is really what they would like to do. You can feel it, you can smell it, it's in the air. It's what they, it's what they say and, and what you can see that they're, they're thinking. They, they, they would love to have um, the message coming from the Polish media, uh, to, to have it look the same or sound the same as it comes from the, 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 the public sector media, that everything in Poland is okay, and any, criti any criticism that comes is, um, is, is, is um, unfair, not true, and anyway, as Ms. Rubinska says, they did all this before, so what, the, 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 what is happening now, there's nothing new where the, the present authorities are doing exactly the same as previously the people were doing. This is just not true, it's nonsense. There, has been a problem always with the politicians and their dirty hands all over the, 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 the public sector media. They've always wanted to have an influence over the media. But what is happening now is completely unprecedented, actually. And it's, um, I'm afraid, I don't know what's happening now in the public sector media because I, I don't watch it anymore. Because actually, it's not only, it's not only, it's not only wrong, but it's actually, it's, it's just unwatchable. But it's there, it has an, an, a great influence on public opinion because it's reaching people th throughout the country. The, the, pri the private sector media is not reaching everyone. This, this, the, 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 and the, the, what they're doing in the public sector media is bolstering their electorate. The opinion polls show them to be at, at, at about 50%. I think that's questionable, but anyway, that's what the opinion polls say. It's, it's effective, but it's just not true, and it's destroying journalism in our country. We are we, we are uh, crossing the, the half 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 an hour, so it, it was really a, a, a speech session. This, but I would like to, uh, to ask you in, in the end, uh, uh, briefly, what would you expect from the international society to do in regard of uh, the media situation in Poland? And we, we can start with you. Uh, I expect your support in uh, our work uh, for freedom of. Uh, press and media in Poland. Alexander? Um, I can only give you some good advice um, as at the end, and I will be a little bit sarcastic, because my colleague is wrong by saying um, peace has 50% support because it has a state media. Um, nowadays, especially young people, don't really watch television anymore, so I don't think that you can gain uh, such support with the help of state media, because this is not a universal instrument anymore. Why do they have 50% support? It is because um, our opposition constantly appeals to Europe. They call this the tactic of uh, uh, the street and uh, the outside world. So they protest and then they try to get help from Europe, European Council, from anybody they can. Um, 
the Polish population, the citizens, don't really like other people meddling in their business. So the more support you will receive, the higher will be um, the support for the law and justice in the Polish population. It's a counter counterproductive. And when I hear things like, you can feel it, you can smell it, it's in the air. I would like that in this discussion when we talk about the situation in Poland, let's stick to the facts and not what you think you can feel, what you think the politicians think. So, 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 so. Um, I would like, um, I would expect a fact-based discussion if we talk about the situation in Poland and to be a little bit more willing to understand the specificity of Poland, understand the situation before you make any interventions. Chris Pominski? Yeah. Or brief? I, brief? It's, it's very brief. I finally can get to read what I wrote to prepare for this session. Uh, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, don't worry. Um, the situation at the moment is stable. We have a vociferous and critical privately owned media and a state-controlled TV and radio sector, which is su supplemented by privately owned newspapers and magazines, which are supported by advertising, serious advertising from state-owned companies. Continued interest and support for independent media, uh, from media freedom defenders, from international, international institutions like the Council of Europe, and foreign as well as local publishers essential. If this disappears, free media in Poland will also disappear. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. all of you, for, for this uh, uh, session. I mean, now have a, a question there. There's a question there. We have a we have a cough. There's a question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we we haven't got much time. Uh, a comment, please. Just a comment, and then we stop. Uh, thank you. A brief comment. Um, my name is Dorota Głowacka, and I work for Helsinki Foundation for Human Rights, which is uh, just to clarify a Polish uh, human rights NGO. Um, and one of our main focus is media freedom. We're not journalists, we're lawyers. Um, and therefore, I would like to contribute in my comment to a, I think, fa fact-based discussion. Um, in our opinion, the law on um, Institute of National Remembrance uh, is a major threat to media freedom and more broadly to freedom of expression. Uh, because it does not relate only to the historical context, it's, it's much broader. It also contains this civil law provision concerning civil defamation of state and Polish nations. I, we believe that this provision can be actually used in order to limit the um, discussion on the current uh, political situation in Poland. And I actually don't quite understand um, the standpoint where, um, just referring to Mrs. Rubinska's statement, that we should not criticize the law because it hasn't provoked any negative consequences yet. I think that the debate on any law makes sense actually before it's adopted. So then we try to um, foresee what can be the negative consequences uh, and basically avoid them. That's the, I think, all the idea behind the, mm, well, um, well-informed discussion. If you are interested in more details concerning the law of National uh, Institute of Remembrance, I invite you to have a look on our stand that's just next to the uh, place where you can have coffee. Um, we have a full legal opinion there concerning this law prepared by our lawyers. Um, that's only in Polish, unfortunately, but we have a leaflet there summarizing this opinion, also available in English. So please go and have a look. And one last sentence. Um, it's also hard for me to agree with the statement that uh, the um, legislative reforms in the area of media freedom that has been conducted in the last two years, uh, namely um, the reform of the public media, has not provoked any negative consequences. We are providing legal aid to journalists, also defending them in courts, and we um, investigated a number of cases, one by one, in a very detailed way, uh, of journalists that were dismissed from public media. And in these cases, I can, um, like referring to the whole material that was covered uh, in the 
judicial proceedings concerning this journalist, I can, I think, state with uh, my full confidence that these journalists were um, disciplinary dismissed for uh, political reasons. Some of them we even managed to reinstate to public media, and the raid, it, it, the, it concerned public, public radio, and the radio actually admitted that their dismissal uh, was unlawful. That was after the management of the radio changed on the way. So um, it's not really true that we can't really observe negative consequences of the legislative reforms. Um, and I think it still makes sense to um, talk about potential negative consequences of the other laws that uh, have been just enacted or are, or are being or are pending in the government, uh, in the parliament. Thank you. Thank you very much for this contribution. And there are possibilities to, to ask more questions after the next panel, uh, which is also about a, a, a state interference in, in, in media. So you are so, so please uh, keep your questions if you have got more questions here for the next. Short one, yes, Andrzej Krajewski, a journalist. Uh, I would like to refer to what Ms. Rubinska says that she doesn't like to talk about senses, uh, smell, and stuff like that. Let me give me the facts. The facts were given, I quote another fact. We are dealing in Poland now with a completely new concept of public media. And the head of Polish public TV, Mr. Kurski, expressed it last uh, October in an interview for Rzeczpospolita. He said, I quote from memory, but it's more or less, the, uh, we have pluralism in um, uh, electronic media in Poland because Polsat and TVN, they are two private uh, um, uh, televisions in Poland are anti-government. So uh, public media should be pro-government and this way we will have pluralism in, uh, in media in Poland. Uh, I want to say that this is uh, exactly opposite what the law says about public media because the law in Article 21 says that public media should be pluralistic impartial, balanced, and independent. Forget independence. But pluralistic, impartial, and balanced... I wholeheartedly uh, agree with you. You will be surprised. Mm, no. You heard me say that I clearly stated... Uh, wait a moment. Can I finish? ...that the public media Can I is finish? biased. Can I finish? Please, go Can ahead. Can I finish? Yes. They are not pluralistic, not impartial, not balanced. And they never were. We are talking about what they are now. And why why didn't are, you protest? And there are a lot of studies which are showing what they were before and what they are now. And you should follow the law, not the idea of pluralism, which is not written in the law. The problem is in Poland that you are not following the law. Thank you. I am not following the law? But I am not doing the public media. You're aware no, it, of that. It, it, I'm just I think it was, it was not you not following the law. It was, oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Coffee break. 20 minutes. We have, you have taken a, a, a bit more of, it, of the coffee break, but we have got tw 20 minutes, and please be back in 20 minutes.